Welcome to Fields of Study from the Masonic Cancer Center. Today we sit down with Dr. Glenn Simmons Jr., Assistant Professor with the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Campus. Hello everyone and welcome to Fields of Study from the Masonic Cancer Center. My name is Max Huber. I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager at the Masonic Cancer Center. In this video series, we like to sit down with some of our faculty, staff, researchers, nurses, and get to learn a little more, a bit more about them, maybe how COVID-19 has affected the work situation. And I am very pleased to be joined today by Glenn Simmons Jr., Dr. Glenn Simmons Jr. He is an assistant professor in the medical school on the Duluth campus. Dr. Simmons, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, so I, I kind of just want to jump in. What's what's your background? How did you, uh, where did you start and how did you end up in Duluth, Minnesota? So I started my research career actually in cancer biology as an undergraduate researcher at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. And then from there, I did graduate research in HIV biology, which um, was definitely different but got me more interested in the health disparities question um, as a result of that work. Um, but then I decided it was probably time for me to get out of that area because it moved very quickly from basic understanding of mechanistic questions to kind of cure research. And I didn't think that was gonna be a good fit for me at the time. And so I moved towards uh, cancer epigenetics and did postdocs in Louisiana and at Texas uh, in Dallas. and then I was recruited to Minnesota and been here since 2017. And you know, you mentioned a couple of warm weather places, Tampa, Louisiana, Texas, and now you're in Duluth. How have the winters been for you? That's always the big question. And honestly, any place that has snow plows on demand, I'm okay. <laughs> now, if I moved kind of out into the more rural areas, I'd probably have some serious issues. Yeah. Um, but it's been pretty, pretty decent. But of course they recruited me during the summers up here. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's how you get you. Yeah. That's how they get you. Oh, it's nice and beautiful. It's warm. At least they do have tunnels up there in Duluth for a lot of the campus. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, you touched on a lot of uh, interesting things involved with your research, but you know, with the current climate with coronavirus, COVID-19, it seems like a lot of people's research efforts have changed. I know for myself, I haven't been to my office in like three months. How has this whole situation and scenario affected your day-to-day -day work? Honestly, it, it was pretty disruptive. I had to shut down my entire cancer biology operation, and that was a pretty bad timing, you know, to say the least. We were just in the process of putting together an NIH grant and we had some really interesting data that was just coming down the pipe and we weren't able to get any more patient samples, obviously, because a lot of the elective surgeries were being put on hold. And then we started kind of stepping back and saying, well, what can be done? A lot of energy went into um, what we know now is the, the major testing effort that's been going on at the, at the U, which I think has been a phenomenal push. But there are other dimensions of this issue that hadn't really gotten as much attention, mainly the idea of how do we really know how many people are infected? And is there anything that we can do to, to really get accurate numbers and get those numbers to reflect not just those who have the most access to resources, but also to those who are able, who are unable to make it to testing facilities who can't afford to make it. And I thought Duluth would be a good opportunity, have a good, uh, be in a good position to take advantage of asking these questions because of the mission, mission specifically of this campus. And so you really got involved in this COVID situation. You've been in, uh, in the media quite a bit lately for it. Tell us about how you went from doing this cancer research into the COVID and what the actual study is that you've been conducting. Well, Luckily, with coronaviruses, they're un luckily or unluckily, depending on how you're looking at it, there's been a good amount of experience in the last decade or so with coronaviruses, whether that was the SARS outbreak in, two in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003, or the MERS outbreak that happened in 2014. So we've seen similar viruses in the public uh, recently. And a lot of people have already been working on dealing with those when this outbreak happened. And so like with those, those the, the units in the NIH that have been working on the vaccines, uh, like some of my colleagues, Kesmikia Corbett, 
uh, for example, have already been working on coronavirus uh, efforts because of these other outbreaks. For us, uh, what our major kind of pivot point was, was is there a way to kind of take what we already know from the coronaviruses and apply that to what we see with COVID-19 specifically? And luckily, there were people who were already doing some studies that kind of asked, answered some of those basic questions we had, which was mainly, does the virus get shed out into wastewater? And can we detect that at discernible levels before we have outbreaks? And is there a way for us to use that information to direct resources within different uh, municipalities and states? So are there any findings with this wastewater study that you can touch on that, that you found uh, rather interesting? Well, you know, you're probably the first person to interview me after we've been able to look at the data. Um, most of the energy uh, in terms of the media that's been uh, contacting us as of late, it was very early on when we just proposed the idea and we weren't willing to talk about what we were seeing yet. Yeah. Now we're starting to see trends. We've been able to, because our project is actually longitudinal. So what we're doing is collecting wastewater samples from municipalities throughout the state of Minnesota. So we're as far north as International Falls and as far south as Worthington. So we're covering almost the entire state. Uh, right now, we have about 22 facilities. I think 22 facilities, might be 21, but I think we're at 22 facilities that have agreed to send us samples on a running basis for the next several months. And we're using PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction analysis. So we're amplifying the genetic material associated with the virus itself. And we're showing that over time in certain areas, you're seeing kind of steady trends. The levels don't really change all that much. Mm -hmm. But in other areas, we're seeing what we would consider a positive trend where it's starting to decrease. But there are still places where those numbers are going up. And that's the part that's kind of, it, it, that's, that's a cause for concern. Mm -hmm. What we're doing now, aside from just getting these relative changes over time, we're trying to develop a statistical model so that we can estimate the numbers that we're seeing based on the PCR reaction. What does that mean in number of infected persons? That's not an easy thing to do. A few labs have tried to do that already um, out there in the world, uh, lab laboratories in Australia, laboratories in, in Massachusetts at MIT, and no one has a perfect formula just yet. So we're working with a different units within the University of Minnesota to actually see if we can pull this off with having longitudinal data from multiple sites, multiple size cities, so that we can actually get a very dynamic and adaptive model that we can then say, based on these numbers we're seeing in viral numbers, we're actually seeing these numbers of people being affected that would be completely independent of individual testing. I just think it's so amazing the adaptability that I've, you know, as I've been doing this, this video series, uh, just the, the researchers that have changed course that have been like, Hey, you know, I can't go into the lab. I can't see my patient patients as much and just how people are adapting and coming up with new things. And, you know, you are a, a cancer researcher by trade, but you're like, I have the skills and the ability. Uh, there's this current situation that's going on. That's affecting not only our state, our country, our world, how can I use the insights and knowledge that I have and put it towards this problem to help solve said problem? Right. Right. It's awesome. It's an, another problem, and something you mentioned earlier, was health disparities. And you were involved in a study earlier this year. Uh, the headline uh, from, from the University of Minnesota Medical School was using social networking to provide health education to African-American men. Uh, you know, we have a health disparities has been a huge topic for Masonic Cancer Center and our community outreach and engagement team. Um, just you see it everywhere, whether it's uh, income based, whether it's uh, race, gender, wh whatever. Um, it, it's a problem and we're hoping to find solutions to it. And with, with the study that you did involved social networking, what are some of the things you found about that? So one of the things that we found was that there are different ways to go about engaging community. And that's the part that's really problematic, especially in Minnesota, which has a very unique kind of demographic layout. So there, a lot of people who haven't lived in Minnesota, like I'm not from Minnesota, clearly. Um, I've been around a lot of other places, but to get to Minnesota and to hear concepts like metropolitan Minnesota, or you have the Twin Cities and then you have greater Minnesota, 
And for the longest, I didn't understand what, you know, what that meant. And it doesn't necessarily answer the question of rural versus urban, because there are cities that are actually outside of the Twin Cities area uh, that would still be considered, you know, a metropolitan area. It might be a small metropolitan area, such as Duluth. Duluth is not rural. Um, now, for folks who come from like a Chicago or a New York City, Duluth might, you know, they might try to paint it as rural, but it's not. Um, and so what we learned is that when you want to have strategies to address specific, specific communities, uh, specific communities of color in particular, the model and the approach has to fit where you are. So one of the things that became very evident is that there are not a lot of centers culturally or, or ethnically centered uh, spaces in many parts of Minnesota. And as the population that is non of non-European ancestry grows within greater Minnesota, that becomes more and more of an issue because it becomes harder to connect to those groups when there are things that need to be addressed that are specific to that demographic. And so what we found was that by utilizing the social networks, the things that are specific to that given population, by figuring out how to engage with that community through their own norms, their normative behaviors, we're able to then access and get information to them and allow it to almost percolate through that community in a normal kind of spread, as opposed to saying, we're just going to have this one-time thing, we're gonna give some pamphlets, we're doing something way more organic, which has seemed to work uh, successfully so far, but it's still a pilot study and we're looking to expand it and get it to more communities so that we can see just how well this works. And it's interesting just because for all of the all of the negatives that you find around social media with trolling and all this other stuff, there are still so many positives that can be found. And it just shows with, with this example that you have and it's with the pilot study and you know, Minnesota is, it might not be the most diverse state in the entire country, but there are still population sectors that, um, that are not of European ancestry and providing the information and finding the ways to do it because it, it's not going to work with every single group to just say, like you said, here's a pamphlet, here's a pamphlet. This is how we've done it for years. You have to, uh, I don't wanna say ingrain yourself, but you have to find different ways to engage and interact with, with uh, different population sectors around our state and around the country. So right. uh, it, it's an interesting study that you guys are doing. And I'm, I'm excited to see uh, it, it expand and maybe grow to some other areas throughout the state. Absolutely. So I always like to end the interviews with this, and this is, I know it's a loaded question. Um, and, and before we end, Dr. Simmons and I were talking right before this. Uh, fun little fact, both of us, our sons turned two on Saturday. So uh, small world. Um, you know, it, so happy birthday to your son. It's uh, Thanks. that uh, I know, like right now we're conducting this while my son is, is taking a nap. So if not, it would be absolutely crazy. But uh, just the small little things you find in this world. And, and don't know where I'm going with it, but I always end them with this loaded question, could be personally, could be professionally, could be whatever. Uh, Dr. Simmons, at this current time in our world, in our state, in our environment that we live in, what gives you hope? Hmm, yeah, that is loaded. Um, I would say the thing that gives me hope professionally and, and basically every, in every aspect is the, the, the reality is that we can learn. We can learn. Um, the one thing I will say, and this might get way more philosophical than people are expecting, um, the thing that on, the, the only thing that I would truly say separates humans from other animals, because I believe that humans are biologically animals, um, is our ability to think and learn um, at a certain level, and we can do that. We can think, we can learn, and we can do better than we've done before. And whether that's science, whether that's religion, whether that's, you know, governmental structures, or just socially, we can do better. Mm -hmm. Because we learn and realize that things are better if we do these things this way, let's, let's go that way. Um, that's happened in science several times over. The way we done things historically turned out to be wrong and we changed as we learned that these new methods are better, they're improved. 
And I think we can apply that same, that same way of thinking, that same level of ingenuity to other aspects. And that gives me hope. Um, maybe it's the, the, the almost the, the naivety uh, of being a scientist, but I always think about the fact that, man, we were so wrong about so much at one point. Now look, we have this now, we know these things. And we can take that advantage of that. Yeah, it's very well put. And you can uh, you can adapt. You can learn in so many different aspects, like you mentioned. So um, let's let's hope we can all learn something, especially in, in today's times and today's environments, and and put that towards uh, a greater good moving forward. All right. Well, Dr. Simmons, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us on Fields of Study. We'll see you in the next episode.